Good evening and welcome to everyone to our important contribution to early American numismatics this evening and our visit from one of the most distinguished scholars in this field. Philip Mossman, our 2005 Huntington Award medalist, has been a collector and numismatic researcher since he was a child. And his interests have not remained childish, however. He uh, has gone on to become a numismatist of the first, the highest caliber, and has produced some of the leading works in the field. His, uh, his book, Money of the American Colonies and Confederation, a Numismatic, Economic, and Historical Correlation, is regarded as one of the finest works on numismatic and economic history of the colonial period. His work is focused on setting the numismatic evidence into a historical context by researching archival documents. Uh, he has spent years doing this on top of a very busy and important career as a medical doctor and researcher. As a graduate of Dartmouth College, he went on to obtain MA and medical degrees at Harvard University and has become one of the leaders in the field of preparing, how would exactly would I describe your field? Therapy for people who have sustained uh, stroke injuries? Rehabilitation medicine. Rehabilitation medicine. In this field, in fact, he is such a pioneer that he is the person who literally wrote the textbook because he found when he entered that, that uh, very little had been put together overall. So in that respect too, as in numismatics, he has really been a pioneer and one of the most significant contributors. He has been a friend of the ANS for many years, uh, took over the editing of the Colonial Newsletter in 1995 when the American Numismatic Society assumed uh, publication of this important vehicle for numismatic research. Uh, he has been the author of a number of very interesting studies in colonial numismatics. The whole period has interested him, partly with a family connection, since I understand among his ancestors were some of the very first uh, settlers in the British colony of Nova Scotia, which he has recognized as being actually uh, much more a part of what we think of as being the 13 colonies that became the United States than has often been recognized in the past. So Nova Scotia, our so-called 14th state or colony at one time. It's great pleasure for me to be able to introduce this gentleman this evening, and I'm looking forward very much to his presentation. Uh, before doing so, though, it's time to honor him a little bit further. And I would like to invite our colonial specialist from our board of trustees, Roger Saboni, who's also our vice president, to make this distinguished award to this very distinguished individual. Oh, <laughs> You're going to take my script. <laughs> and thank you for that trustee designation. There's actually a couple of them, a couple of other trustees that might vie for that uh, that like, uh, honorific as well. Like Eric Newman. <laughs> uh, like Eric Newman and a few others. But having said that, I am uh, quite pleased and honored on behalf of the trustees of the American Numismatic Society to uh, present to you, Phil, the Archer Huntington medal and award for numismatic excellence. We thank you for your tremendous contributions to numismatic literature and, and I particularly for <laughs> colonial contributions. So Phil, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Andy Warthol predicted, everyone will have their 15 minutes of fame, and I guess this is mine. <laughs> Before we move off further, yeah. if anyone does have a cell phone on, please do turn it off or shut it down to not make any noise because of our webcasting. Oh, I see. OK. Uh, I never would have believed 20 years ago when I joined the ANS that I would be here today. And in preparation for this event, I did read the statements from some of the prior Huntington recipients to find out what was appropriate to say. And for the most part, they gave some thumbnail sketches of their professional careers. And compared to them, I'm a rank amateur. Uh, my numismatic interests indeed got off at an early age and uh, at a very, very humble start. In fact, my first interest was sparked by an old yellow Yardley's lavender box 
that was in my mother's bottom bureau drawer, a box that was essentially empty except for a hodgepodge of stray buttons, elastics, and other sewing paraphernalia. And as you no doubt guessed, in one of the little pockets, there was a handful of mostly English coins. These were my parents' unspent pocket change deposited there ever since they came up from Bermuda in the late uh, 20s. And I used to enjoy examining these coins and arranging them and soon started adding some of my own. By the time I was in the seventh grade, I was showing the early symptoms of a severe case of numismatics. And that soon became manifest as the chronic relapsing variety. Uh, living in a farming community, my other hobby was raising chickens. And one Saturday, a neighbor paid me for a dozen eggs in American large cents. Now, those days are gone forever. Uh, <laughs> By my late teens and early 20s, I was a hopeless incurable. The eventual direction of my condition uh, was sealed in 1962 when I bought my first state coppers. Two Connecticut's and one New Jersey for one dollar each. Uh, how quickly this fascinating series of state coppers took root in the fertile mind of my obsessive compulsive nature. I endeavored to learn all I could about the role of these intriguing coinages in the early years of our country. But unfortunately for me, some 44 years ago, I was a virtual babe in the woods and had not the slightest idea of numismatic resources available to assist me. I just did not know that they existed which for all practical purposes is the same thing. If you don't know something exists, it doesn't exist for you. And responding to an ad in Coin World, I met the late Dr. David Sonderman. And to him, I'm indebted for my, to my, first, for my first direction. And he helped me increase my library and also expanded my uh, own personal type collection. And with the help of David and Richard August and Norman Poulin and the late Dr. Robert Hinckley and occasional coin shows and the auction houses of Stax and Bowers and Ruddy, uh, my collection grew and particularly using the uh, catalogs from Stax and Bowers and Ruddy, I found those to be a great assistance. And by 1975, I integrated all this newly acquired information into a rather informal essay. In 1980, I submitted this essay to the Colonial Newsletter, and it was rejected by its editor, Jim Spillman, and it should have been rejected. But it was rejected with the encouragement to try harder. And Jim put me in touch with Ray Williamson, who was a true numismatic scholar who helped to direct my thinking and research activities. Ray pointed out to me that I was missing the importance of contemporaneous exchange rates of the circulating currency, and he recommended that I read the works of uh, Professor John McCusker, who is an eminent economic historian. And I have been working with John for the last several years uh, mutually assisting each other. And then gradually the pieces uh, fell into place and I uh, integrated this uh, into a final work in 1986, which was then published in the, uh, as, as an initial draft in the Colonial Newsletter. Uh, it was published there for other people to, sh to share it with other colonial enthusiasts. Within days after the colonial newsletter was mailed to its patrons, my secretary told me that this very pleasant man from St. Louis had called and would call back in the evening. Now, this very pleasant man from St. Louis has remained my friend, mentor, and colleague ever since. And he's sorry he can't be here tonight, but he just opened his museum. And uh, Eric Newman, via the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society, has always been a great help uh, to me. But one of Eric's first acts was to introduce me to the ANS, an organization I had heard of, but really didn't know the scope of its mission. What had started out for me as a self-instruction guide to teach myself about pre-federal numismatics had grown like Topsy into a full-fledged volume. 
And now, Les Elam, John Kleberg, and the ANS staff guided me through the process of developing my CNL monograph into an ANS book that was published in 1993. But in reality, this book still remains a self-instruction guide for me, since hardly a day passes I don't refer to it, refreshing my memory with one fact or another that has become foggy with the passage of time. But at least I remember where to look for what I want. <laughs> Uh, since the 1993 publication, I've continued to develop several other ideas that I won't, I won't um, bar, bore you with tonight. But just to mention that about two years ago, I started to read all the ANS numismatic notes and monograph series that dealt with uh, colonial numismatics. And that series is a true, true treasure trove. Uh, of interest in this NNM, NN and M collection. Uh, this collection was originally uh, started by Archer M. Huntington, and I'm benefiting again from his generosity. Uh, several works in this series involve counterfeits, and that stimulated another undertaking that has resulted in a hundred or more page paper dealing with counterfeits, uh, counterfeit coins and counterfeit paper money of the pre-federal era. I concentrated particularly in a re review of the colonial laws dealing with counterfeiters and counterfeits. Uh, today for the Margaret Thompson lecture, I have uh, selected for my topic the section on counterfeit paper currency. Um, I'm afraid that my case of chronic relapsing numismatics is truly incurable. In regard to mending conditions of the body and mind, I'm reminded of the biblical proverb, Physician, heal thyself. It's truth, I am a physician, but I don't want to be healed. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy my case of numismatics, but I have one word of caution for you all. Be warned, it's highly contagious. Again, thank you very much for this recognition. <clears throat> Now, okay. The uh, title of the lecture tonight is Counterfeit and Altered Bills of Credit from 1690. Two years ago, I began a comprehensive review of early American counterfeiting in, involving all facets of currency debasement. Today, I selected one aspect to share with you, namely counterfeit paper money. You might ask, why do people counterfeit? Well, the obvious answer, it's a quick way to wealth until you get caught. And I must admit my question is pretty naive and not unlike that one that was posed to Willie Sutton when a reporter asked him, why do you rob banks? To the journalist who was expecting some moralistic justification for his actions, Sutton tersely replied, because that's where the money is, stupid. So there was certainly an individual get-rich-quick motive to making fake money, but it was also a, a, a motive of national policy, such as the wholesaling counterfeiting of the continental currency during the revolution by England, who circulated the fake money as a weapon of, to sabotage our already tottering economy. Uh, since the provincial governments were who were forbidden by England to print paper currency, uh, these colonial emissions starting in 1690 with Massachusetts were not money per se, but truly bills of credit which backed governmental borrowing for specific objectives such as military campaigns or public works projects. These bills were either redeemable, redeemable by anticipated tax revenues or were loans backed by mortgage real estate of, of qualified buyers, okay, sorry, qualified borrowers. Some bills were interest bearing while others offered a 5% premium if used to pay your taxes. 
All of them had specific redemption dates at which time they were called in and burned. Uh, when emissions were reauthorized beyond the original redemption date, the new date was engraved on the plate and more bills printed. Since most bills eventually found their way back to the colonial estate treasury for redemption and, and destruction, the census of existing bills in relationship to the size of the original emission is very small. The bulk of the paper money uh, that is in present day collections comes from several sources. Colonial or revolutionary issues that either collapsed and were never redeemed, they were printed but never issued, they were confiscated counterfeits or altered bills that were retained as legal evidence. Uh, whenever wholesale counterfeiting was discovered, there were many occasions when, count, when colonies recalled and canceled the entire denomination before the redemption date, thereby invalidating both the genuine and the false bills. Unfortunately, old and tattered counterfeits might pass more easily if their telltale characteristics were difficult to identify because of wear and tear. Although counterfeit money certainly inflicted considerable economic damage in its day, it has provided a valuable link for modern day study since some of the counterfeits may be the only indication that certain issues existed because the genuine issues were called in and burned and only the counterfeits remained unscathed. Consequently, it's not at all surprising that find that some uh, counterfeit paper money has survived in greater numbers than the genuine items since the forged notes were retained by authorities to use as evidence to prosecute the counterfeiters. Also, because they were non-negotiable, they may have escaped the ravages of circulation and were better preserved. In other instances, when confiscated counterfeits were ordered destroyed, only a few bills survived for our inspection. <clears throat> this is a bill which was in, in fact, this same bill was in two of Stack's recent auctions, which is a, a counterfeit New York 1780 bill. And this one is counterfeit, but the interesting thing is it was punch canceled just like a normal bill. So the question is, did this escape the teller at the bank, so to speak, and did it get, uh, uh, was it redeemed, or was it uh, punch canceled as a counterfeit? This I don't know, but you see it is definitely a counterfeit when you look at the A of state and the O in New York, here and here, and then compare it with a normal S and the normal O, which is uh, taken from a genuine bill. So anyway, this is a question that we probably will, uh, will never know. Um, in Eric Newman's classic work on American, early American paper money, he cataloged over 450 emissions of colonial, state, and continental Congress paper with a total census, census of some 4,500 individual notes. And the reason that I know that is that I counted them. Among these, among them, among these 4,500, there are 280 issues known to contain counterfeit bills. It is about 6% of the known notes do have counterfeits amongst them. And some are more convincingly done than others. The first scheme for counterfeiting currency uh, with engraved plates and a printing press was uncovered in 1704 and involved a gang of five who members, whose members included Peregrine White Jr. and Benoni White. These, well, these men were the son and grandson of the famous Peregrine White Sr., the first Mayflower baby born in New England of English parentage. So the kids did not do as well as granddaddy did. And that's why I mentioned that it's a picture in your office about the Pilgrim's Landing that that baby was born very soon. In fact, he may have been born in, uh, in um, Massachusetts uh, Bay. And his, his son and grandson distinguished themselves in another way. The father was acquitted and son Bernoni turns uh, crown evidence testifying against his accomplices in return for a pardon. 
But as I understand, the grandfather had died about two weeks before his family, uh, his descendants were indicted, so I guess he never knew. <clears throat> By the 1740s, uh, counterfeiting, which had started off as a local cottage industry, was evolving into a well-organized underworld network with contacts throughout the colonies, and people who were the counterfeiters followed all walks of life. A 1768 newspaper article estimated that some 500 counterfeiters were actively operating between Nor New Hampshire and North Carolina, working in combination to mint and pass legal tender foreign coins, as well as to print a wide variety of colonial paper currency. <clears throat> Among the many bands of counterfeiters, perhaps Owen Sullivan and the Dover Money Club were the no most notorious. Their bills were so perfectly counterfeited, it was difficult to distinguish their work from the genuine. By Sullivan's own admission, there were at least 29 members in his fraternity of felons who operated in Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and New York, printing and passing counterfeits from several colonies. But Sullivan's luck ran out on April 29th, 1756, when he was condemned to hang. The sentence was delayed for the want of a hangman to dispatch this legendary uh, criminal, as well as the fact that the night before, somebody had cut down the gallows. <clears throat> now, Sullivan's execution was really a circus day in town. The convict made a speech to the assembled crowd, which was later printed as his illustrated autobiography. When on the scaffold, he was asked by the spectators uh, to reveal the denominations of the New York bills he had counterfeited. To this request, he replied, you must find that out by your learning. This is a woodcut of the uh, execution of this notorious counterfeiter. Only two copies of this have survived, one of which belongs to Eric, who kindly supplied this to me to use tonight. Now, I'll point out to you right here, uh, you may not see, but there's two kids playing tag there in front of the scaffold. It was really a big picnic day uh, for everybody except for Owen Sullivan. <clears throat> <laughs> now, before I can talk more about counterfeits, I have to describe for a moment as to how paper money was actually made. And there were three, possibly four different methods, which I'll go into briefly. Uh, <laughs> as the time progressed, uh, paper money was much more, uh, much, it, it, the, the production of it changed from a very simplistic to an increasingly complex uh, uh, method. And then one might in, uh, anticipate the counterfeiters very quickly devised uh, methods to meet the new challenges of the improved paper money. Now, the first sort of, of normal of, of paper money, or the simplest, are uh, the, uh, the handwritten bills of North Carolina. Now, lacking the availability of a printing press, the simplest of all these bills, the first four emissions from North Carolina from 1712 to 1729, were actually handwritten. Although some were indented and others had a uh, paper-covered wax seal of the colony. But despite the fact that they were indented and had some anti-counterfeiting measure and had five signatures, this seemed no impediment to their being counterfeited because all it required was a pen and ink to copy this uncomplicated currency. Now this is a very rare, genuine, handwritten 40-shilling note of North Carolina of November 27, 1729, and this, as you can see, was in a recent Ford auction. Um, I'll point out one other thing in this note, which we'll see later on, is how it was folded, a crease down here. Uh, you can't really see the crease. Well, there may not have been a crease across here, but others do. And this was very common to find these bills folded. Now, the next is a handwritten five-pound counterfeit note. 
Uh, and you see that somebody had written counterfeit across the top, but it's F-I-T. And th uh, this note uh, is, um, this again was recently in the Ford auction, and this is labeled contemporaneously as a counterfeit. Now, what was fun to do with these two notes was to compare the signatures. In, in my way of looking at it, the E. Mosley was probably the best one that was copied. Uh, the uh, the uh, Thomas Swain was quite poorly done and probably not very convincing. And really very um, taken with copying signatures, I looked at another signature that appeared on the bills, and that was of William Downing. And now, for the audience, can you pick out which is the real William Downing? If I were in, yes, Ray, you have your hand up. Excuse me? Number four? Uh, now, you're saying that this is, ah, uh, darn it, I went backwards. Uh, <laughs> To me, that's the one that looks the most like a fake. <laughs> but being, a, being technologically challenged, I pushed the wrong button first, and it is indeed the one in the center uh, is the real William Downing. And um, sometimes copying signatures was a major problem for the counterfeiter and forger, and I'll talk more about that later. <coughs> The um, next thing that would occur with a counterfeit note, and certainly with these North Carolina notes, is in one that uh, Eric loaned me, that this is a counterfeit note. And on the back of the note, Mr. Moses Prince wrote, received this bill of Mr. Jarvis Jones of Parker Tank about the beginning of March 1730. And of course, uh, that was done that in case he got caught with the note, he has made indication that he knew that this was fake and this could be used and this probably was used in evidence against um, Mr. Jones as a passer, uh, that is an, an, an utterer, or perhaps he was the original author of this fake. Now, having talked about the um, um, handwritten notes, Let's talk about the next kind, or which is the earliest kind, and that was notes from engraved plates. Now, the earliest paper money in Massachusetts, the 1690 emission, used engraved copper plates, and this was a very complex, time-consuming process. The, the engraved plate had to be warmed. The ink applied in a manner that filled all the incised lines of the plate, and then the excess ink was wiped away, leaving it only in the engraved recesses. Then damp paper was laid across the plate, covered with a pad, and run over with a roller or run through a press. And then the sheet of notes was hung up to dry. And usually several denominations were printed on a single sheet. Now in 1716, this is a 1716 uh, note, as you see here, um, this was originally authorized in 1713. They ran out of them, so they reprinted in 1716, and then they reprinted again, I'm sorry, in 1714, and then they reprinted more in 1716, and this is a genuine Massachusetts note. And please note how this one has been folded lengthwise and across the middle. And we will revisit this note later on because of something else interesting uh, in it. Now, the most common process for making uh, paper money was to print notes on a press with movable type, just like the pages of a book or a newspaper. This was much faster and more efficient. And as you might expect, those who provided that sort of note under contract to the government were usually commercial printers, and frequently they were newspaper publishers. And many colonies of the many colonial and state bills were printed from lead, uh, from lead type that was set in rows and set within a type form or so called printing chase. Now, here's a, a good example of this um, 
1737 Massachusetts five pence note. Uh, this is all done by typeset, and the decorative border is either a woodcut or it is a lead cast of a woodcut, or it could be the uh, lead cast of a copper plate. But the thing is that you could not ever uh, use engraved plates and typeset together because they had t entirely different inking requirements and uh, uh, the uh, typeset would actually indent the paper, whereas an engraved plate was basically a surface phenomenon. Uh, now, you could, and this did happen here, you could use a combination of the engraved plate and the typeset for one side of the note, and then use the, say, if you use en engraved here on this, on the front of the note, this was done by Paul Revere, a famous Massachusetts codfish note, and this is all engraved, and he printed, he ran these off, and then set the note, sent them to a uh, printer who printed the back of the note from typeset. And this tree is a cast uh, type, and all of this is from typeset. And the interesting thing about this note is that there was poor registry between the front and the back, and you see that, that they don't uh, coincide. So it was just a little bit of a shift as they were using the two different processes. Now, printing currency from engraved plates was not without its problems uh, or detractors. As, narr as narrated to the Rhode Island Assembly in 1728 by James Franklin, who was an older brother of Benjamin. Franklin was very disparaging about engraved plate printing that he claimed was no more secure than writing on paper with a pen since the ink remained on the surface of the paper whenever the plates were not deeply cut enough uh, to create any type of impression upon the paper. Uh, also, if an engraved plate were inconsistently inked between printings, an inequality in color could result from one sheet to the next, and people might uh, confuse these for counterfeits. And if a portion of the bill were light, the lighter in hue and insufficient detail, they were sure that they would have a counterfeit, and these would be very hard to tell apart. And Franklin, as an experienced printer, advocated the use of raised type from a conventional printing press, since the inked impression would penetrate the surface of the paper, making it impossible to thoroughly erase uh, or alter its denominations. Uh, this presentation by Franklin to the Rhode Island Assembly was made in the hope of securing the colony's currency contract, which unfortunately was awarded elsewhere. Uh, however, his brother Benjamin in Philadelphia was a very active paper money uh, printer, and he supplied paper money for the colonies of New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Now, what about anti-counterfeiting measures? Well, to outmaneuver the skilled forges, an anti-counterfeiting arsenal was developed. It involved many intricate printing devices and subterfuges designed to frustrate the copying of paper money. Among these was the use of extensive varig and a variegated paper with colored threads or mica uh, inserted, watermarked uh, stock, multiple signatures, intricately engraved designs, indented bills, which you'll see later, uh, complex two-color and complex two-color printing. To further complicate the process, multiple type set, type size fonts um, could be used uh, so that a bill was not printed by the same font uh, in, in all of its features. Nature prints introduced by Benjamin Franklin were another common tactic devised to discourage uh, counterfeiters wherein a lead cast was made from a plaster mold of a leaf, and this was frequently used as a central motif. Uh, other emissions contain artfully designed trickery, such as purposefully misspelled words, uh, printing errors, secret marks, 
or intentional ink blocks to serve as decoys uh, to confuse a potential forger who wouldn't know whether an observed flaw he saw was an accident or a cleverly uh, contrived strategy to detect counterfeiting. Other denominations had a specific denominational insignia to discourage altering a bill to a higher denomination since the insignia would be difficult to obscure. From 1738 until the revolution, Pennsylvania money, uh, on Pennsylvania money, the name of the state was deliberately misspelled on many bills. And this was a complex plan both to detect alteration and to confuse counterfeiters. Now, these early printing techniques are well described by Eric Newman, who questioned how effective they were. Also back in, in 1705, uh, Joseph Felt uh, made this comment about anti-counterfeiting expedients adopted by Massachusetts. He said, he made this satirical aside, uh, that the effectiveness of these measures was the same as love's love laughs at a, of a locksmith. Uh, so did the public defraud a laugh at these sporting methods that they did trying to confuse him. Now I will show examples of, oop, 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 sorry. I'll show examples of all these different anti-counterfeiting devices which I think are very interesting and clever. Now, this is a genuine uh, Maryland bill of 1774, and this bill has 15 different type fonts. It has a very complex design. Over here, you cannot read it, or it's down here, it's tis counterfeit to death. These are leaves, um, uh, um, casts of leaves that were used on the reverse of the bill. This is a secret mark. All notes of this April 10th emission had a secret mark. And for the $2 mark, mark, there was a dot above the A in rate. And all the other notes would have some little, um, you wouldn't know whether a fly walked across the bill or whether or not this was a, um, a purposefully uh, placed mark. Also, you see that this was for $2, and they had two Spanish mill dollars here. Uh, it was signed by two um, individuals. And this is all a typeset note, and these are either wood blocks or they are uh, lead casts of, uh, of wood blocks. Now, this is also indented, and you can see here that this is cut on a bias. And what would happen is that these notes would be printed and then they would be bound like a lottery, like a, a raffle ticket that you might buy. And what would happen is that when it came time to issue the note, the note would be cut away from the stub, which was still in a bound book, and it would be cut in an irregular pattern. So when a particular note with a corresponding serial number um, I don't know the serial number, oh, the serial number here, the corresponding serial number on the stub, uh, that they would be compared, and if they didn't match, you would not get your, um, you were unable to, to redeem it. Now, this business of indenting notes um, was a problem if this end of the note became very worn and irregular, and if it, would be, if it was mutilated, it would no longer match the, uh, the stub that was in the treasurer's office. Rhode Island discontinued indented notes in 1738, even though the procedure showed up many a counterfeit that would otherwise have been redeemed. Uh, except for uh, lower denominations, all bills were hand signed, usually by more than one official, using uh, different colored ink. And forging a, a convincing signature could be a problem. Now, one way of doing this was to place a glass pane between a genuine and a fake note and trace the signature of the legal note under the newly made counterfeit. For skilled forgers who are frequently uh, accomplished engravers or silversmiths, this might not be a problem. As we have noted with Owen Sullivan, who, by all reports, could forge difficult signatures to perfection. 
Now, the next note, um, oops. The next note is a New Jersey six pound note of March 25th, 1776. And I have to ad ad admit that this is probably the neatest looking colonial note there is. And in the, I saw today at the display at the Federal Reserve, uh, you have another note of this emission, but it's, it's, not the, uh, it's not the six pound one. And this bill is printed in two colors, red and blue. The seal and borders are intricately engraved. It has three signatures. Uh, there are two sun faces here. Now, for every three pounds, there was a sun face. So the three pound note would have one sun face, six pound two, nine pound three, which means that you could not get a three pound note and raise it to a nine pound note because there's no way that you could put on two more sun faces. I'm interesting, none of this series has been known to be counterfeited or altered, so something worked. Now in the next one here, this is the small change note of the Bank of North America. Uh, these were unsigned, but they used nine different print fonts. Now these are the, um, the one penny bill, and this is the three penny bill, and you see this has this variegated marbleized paper that no counterfeiter could have ever copied anything of that intricacy. Uh, the um, <clears throat> province of Rhode Island uh, started making paper money in 1710, and they were not technically prepared for the challenge of, pro of producing quality notes since they were using ordinary ledger paper. And in there, it was completely unsuitable for the practice. And from the very beginning, uh, it was an ideal setup for the counterfeiter because they were, the Rhode Island bills were crudely engraved. They were very easy to copy. And also there were a great number of bills and the people were not familiar with them. So they didn't know if they had a fake note or a real one. Now in his study of counterfeiting of Rhode Island, Richard Bowen, uh, mentioned that he ranked Mary Butterworth of Rehoboth, Massachusetts, who was an ambitious, aggressive mother of seven, as the cleverest woman forger in New England. Her career, starting in 1716 at the age of 30, differed from all others of her professions in that she never touched a printing press or an engraved plate. Her technique, which was recounted, recounted by an accomplice, it described how she would work at her kitchen table, lightly passing a hot flat iron over a piece of damp muslin that was stretched over a genuine engraved bill. Now the heat caused the cloth to pick up the writing from the note, and then in turn she placed this over a piece of new, of, of new paper, and next by applying this iron firmly, she transferred the image from the muslin cloth right on to her future counterfeit. Now with the basic designs on a new piece of paper, uh, she went over them with pen and ink, making exact copies of the originals. Mary did so well with her Rhode Island five pound note that the entire emission was recalled by the colony in 1727. It was estimated that she made about a thousand pounds of more in bogus currency from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And this was a family-operated business that went unsuspected for seven years until a loose tongue sunk her ship. Uh, with her iron-on technique, she had no copper plates to worry about. There was no incriminating ex evidence to explain since all of her tools were simply single-use, expendable items immediately consigned to the fireplace, leaving no telltale tracks. Without material evidence, neither Mary nor her accomplices could ever be convicted. Uh, the authorities were frequently frustrated because gangs of accomplished counterfeiters did such good work, they could not separate the false bills from the genuine. And this inability to, to distinguish the false from the uh, genuine resulted in the complete uh, uh, withdrawal of, of many issues. 
In 1722, Rhode Island authorities recovered some 1,190 pounds in bogus bills, which amounted to one and a half percent of the 80, 80 pounds of the 80,000 pounds in genuine currency that had been printed to date. So here they had a one and a half percent counterfeit uh, score. And now the next I'm going to talk about is altered bills. Now. An altered bill, altering a bill is another sort of currency tampering. It was very common in the pre-federal era. And an altering a bill is where a forger raised the denomination of a genuine note one at a time by erasing the printed numbers in the legends and substituting a greater value. It is inaccurate to describe this as a counterfeit. It is an altered, uh, it's an altered genuine note. And raising such notes was, was usually a solo, work-intensive, low-scale activity requiring only a quill pen, properly colored inks, and a steady, sober, skilled hand with which to obfuscate the original denomination and then superimpose a higher number. History tells us that Robert Fenton was the first person tried in 1691 for altering with pen and ink the earliest paper money of the colonies, which was the 1690 Massachusetts emission. Fenton's victim was Mrs. Nathaniel Jewell, to whom he passed 37 notes he had raised from two shillings or two shilling sixpence to 10 shillings or 20 shillings. Although the jewels prosecuted the forger, bearing the legal expense themselves, which happened in those days, Fenton was never convicted, and the couple was swindled out of 22 pounds, 10 shillings. Now, this is an, an engraved uh, 1690 Massachusetts bill, uh, which was raised, and this may have been the same type of one that Fenton uh, pawned off on the Jewell family. And you see here, uh, this was a TWO, or two, two, uh, tuppen, two shilling sixpence raised to 20, and a zero added here. Now, all notes of this first emission that are known today are, uh, are altered. No genuine unaltered note exists, because, of course, they were called in, in and burned, and these were uh, maintained as evidence and were probably liberated from some um, file in a district attorney's office at one time or another. And um, at the time in Massachusetts, the, the, the victim, so to speak, had to uh, foot the cost of prosecution. And a few years later, the province did reimburse the innocent recipients of false notes because this would not only remove the bad notes from circulation, but also guarantee the integrity of the currency in general. By interrogating law-abiding citizens as to how they received bogus money, uh, authorities were able to trace where they came from. And this was similar to that North Carolina note where uh, the man wrote in the back uh, basically the history of how he received the note. Now, doubtless, some people, particularly the illiterate, became innocently involved when spending a false bill that was foisted upon them during a period of uh, lack of vigilance. When others found themselves the unfortunate owners of fake currency, the natural instinct would be to get rid of the bogus cash as expeditiously as possible. It's sort of akin to avoid being caught with the queen of spades. Uh, this next note is a genuine uh, August 16th, 1710 Rhode Island two shilling note, which was raised to 20 shillings. Now, the only raising was done was adding a zero to the two. This was sort of very naively done, and I would not know as how long this one would have passed in circulation before being picked up by somebody who was able to read. Again, you can see this note has been folded in four. Uh, this uh, next note is a Rhode Island July 5th, 1715, a three shilling note, which was raised to 30 shillings. And you see here this THR and then the RE, uh, the, the, R, the, 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 the EE of three was replaced by an RTY and a zero was added to the three to make 
uh, 30 shillings, uh, sorry, make three shillings into 30 shillings. This was a bit better, uh, more skillfully done, but certainly not uh, very convincing. Now, uh, another way of altering a note, having talked about using the uh, pen and ink, was to excise the old value with a sharp knife and then paste in substitute numbers wherever the original uh, denomination appeared and put in something uh, that would be uh, more suitable for you to, to pay for the weekly groceries. And this is the, 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 four, the third scheme was something which was uh, uh, con contained in the Massachusetts provincial records and there were two sort of very devious methods of how to alter currency. Now, you notice that I've been pointing out to you the fact that these bills were folded, usually in, in quarters. And um, frequently, with this folding, um, and this note is one that we have seen before, that these bills would split along this line. And it's not uncommon to find bills of this vintage that are sewn together, pasted together, glued together, trying to, trying to get them back into one piece. Now, this Massachusetts bill is very interesting in that it really has a design flaw, is that all of the legal signatures appear below the equator here. Uh, here are the legal signatures, and the denomination appears up north. So, I mean, this is just a setup where you could get a note, and let's say it had already been split. Uh, you could negotiate the upper part for, like, let's say if it was a five shilling note, you could negotiate half of it for two shilling sixpence. But then you had the lower part with the legal signatures that you could splice anything you wanted to on the top. So let's say that you had a um, half of a one pound note uh, you could, that you got for 10 shillings, you could splice the 10 shillings onto a, a legal, say, two shilling sixpence lower half and thereby increase the note by creating a sort of a hermaphrodite. Um, and this doesn't show well um, here. Uh, this, is in, this is in light blue. And this is where you can graft the higher upper denomination onto a, a, um, the lower half with normal signatures. Or you could, counterf you could counterfeit a note or get a counterfeit note and attach that. And looking at the numbers, this is the type of profit. Let's say you got a three shilling note. Let's pass the upper half as 18 pence. Reserve the bottom half with the legal signatures. Maybe you had an already divided one pound note, which you got for 10 shillings. Graph the two together and make a new one pound note. Total expense would be 13 shillings. You could pass it for 21 and a half shillings, making a profit of eight shillings sixpence. Or if you used a counterfeit upper half, you could increase your profit to 18 shillings and sixpence. Now, it took very long before um, Massachusetts made these notes for a number of years before they tumbled to the fact that we had just better print something that gives the denomination in several uh, areas of the note. Now, other, other anti-altering measures would be to have uh, specific insignias for each denomination with vignettes or bells or sun faces. We've already seen the sun faces and mark the denomination on each uh, quadrant of the bill. And this was a relatively effective way in preventing altering. Now, this is a very well-known note from New York where they use the bells. And here, um, each bell basically is five, shilling, five shillings. And here it has a V, with the, the bell with a V in it as a five shilling. And so this is a 10 pound note. And in that same series, you could have a two pound note that had two bells, three pound note with three, and this is what a single five had. Now these notes were very commonly counterfeited, but you couldn't alter them. 
So they, at least they stopped one problem. Another method to stop altering is have each note of a series have something different on it. And in these North Carolina notes, every note of this particular emission had a different animal in the left lower, uh, the, I'm always saying, this is the medicine coming through, the left lower half, not the left lower quadrant, uh, is an anti-altering uh, um, uh, vignette. And uh, this particular nine shilling note had the lion. Oh, here's our friend E. Mosley again. I didn't just notice that. Remember, he had the, his signature was counterfeited before. Um, I guess I don't recognize these other gentlemen. Now, uh, again, if you were going to divide a bill to make small change, you could get some fraudulent representation of, which, uh, of what the bill was. And so they started writing the denomination and each quadrant of the, of the um, reverse side. And this is a very, very well used um, 1772 Pennsylvania three pence note. And on the reverse, three pence is written in each quadrant. Now it's very common in those days with, with uh, shortages of small change to get this note and a three pence, if you cut it, oh, you can't see here, or maybe you can. This note has been, has been folded many times. So if you took the half of the top of it, it could pass for one pence halfpenny, or you could have it, if you only had a quarter of it, it could pass for three farthings as small change. But this prevented you from getting this uh, note, this quadrant, and doctoring it up to a different uh, denomination because it was very, very uh, uh, plainly printed. And this, of course, was a typeset print that this is, uh, was indented uh, into this paper. Now, alterating individual bills one at a time, for the most part, was considered a lesser offense than the mass printing of reams of counterfeit paper money. And this is what happened to Abel Buell, who was a skilled silversmith and later the engraver of Connecticut and Fujio Coppas. He was married in 1763, and as a newlywed, he had a cash flow problem, which he attempted to solve by altering and passing four Connecticut notes raised from two shilling sixpence to 30 shillings. He was apprehended, and for this ill-advised caper, uh, suffered a branded forehead and a clipped ear. Now, some of the most skillfully falsified provincial notes were printed in plates engraved by Irish, English, German, and Dutch professionals who were commissioned by American counterfeiters. They either made just the plate alone, or they had the whole bill ready for signing. The Pennsylvania notes of 1720 uh, were so successfully counterfeited that within four years, the entire emission had to be called in because they could not tell the good from the bad. But that wasn't before 6,000 pounds had been passed. <laughs> these are, uh, apparently these were imported from England. Now Irish made counterfeits of March 25th, 1724 were imported into New York. These were New Jersey notes, but they were imported into New York in such numbers that the entire denomination was demonetized in 1728. <laughs> now, this is a New Jersey six shilling note of that emission, 1724. And it's possibly, this was made by, uh, this was poss possibly an Irish uh, import. Five out of the eight issues of this emission was so widely counterfeited, it was necessarily necessary to recall them. And even though this bill is uh, uh, in, indented, uh, it just uh, did not, um, it, it did not protect it. Now, approaching the revolutionary period, uh, more paper money was printed not only by the, by the Congressional, by, by, the, by the Continental Congress, but also by the states. And here is pictured a genuine $80 and $55 emission uh, continental currency. And these were in two colors. They have some very complex uh, borders. And as you'll see on the reverse, they had the complex uh, leaf design that was invented, as I said earlier, by Benjamin Franklin. 
But despite these precautions, two entire emissions of 1777 and 1778 uh, were so widely counterfeited that they were recalled. Now, the chief offender at this time was the English government, who counterfeited and circulated the continental and provincial currency as a strategy to further uh, undermine an already weak uh, economy. Uh, while some of these notes were printed in England and shipped to America for dissemination by the uh, loyalists, the major villainy to a great took place right here in New York Harbor on the HMS uh, Phoenix, uh, where they uh, printed these notes. And these were distributed throughout the New England colonies. In one failed scheme to place this money in circulation, two bags of counterfeit notes were concealed in a wagon train that was carrying supplies and clothing and other humanitarian relief for British prisoners and was traveling behind the American lines with a under a flag of truce. And uh, the, other, um, the other way to, to, to um, protect against receiving counterfeits, and this does not show well here, but this is a blue uh, counterfeit detector note of 1778. And what this was was a note printed on blue paper uh, by, the, by the normal process, and this was not signed or not numbered, and all it was was a specimen copy for people to compare with the notes that they received in circulation to see whether or not they were, they were receiving, uh, whether or not what they had was a fake or a genuine note. Uh, when, uh, whereas all the genuine Congress notes were from typeset, Several emissions of the continental notes, were, uh, of the counterfeit ones, were also printed from engraved plates. And this is a recent Ford um, auction note. And this is uh, an engraved note. And if you look very carefully, you do not get consistency in the uh, different letters because they were not from um, engraved from, they were not from typeset, but this was individually engraved because the counterfeiter did not have the proper type fonts, so he had to copy it uh, 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 by engraving it. Now, um, the counterfeiting of America's notes did not stop with the revolution. In 1787, a plot was foiled in England to engrave plates and to print several thousand North Carolina and South Carolina bills. The same year in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, local authorities uncovered a, a plot to counterfeit current New York bills, but the scheme was thwarted before any damage was done. Now, catchy phrases on a note such as to counterfeit his death and other terrifying threats did not seem to overburden the consciences of counterfeiters or create sufficient anxiety as to warrant a career change. It just seemed to encourage them to try harder. Uh, but they had a lot of material in which to practice since just before the revolution, paper currency uh, comprised three quarters of the colonial money supply. And counterfeiting paper money did not stop with the birth of the new nation. As a matter of fact, it was just getting off to a good start. It was geared up to the challenges of the next uh, century. There was the banknote explosion of the 1820s, where many, many uh, notes were counterfeited. In fact, in 1860, New York was the world center for counterfeit paper money. Now this brief review has um, dealt only with the counterfeiting of paper money, but please remember that, uh, that during this time, uh, these the same gangs who printed the paper money also were, were making coins, uh, the legal tender coins, especially the Spanish mill dollar. Their business was also flourishing, since as late as 1857, it was estimated that up to 2% of the coinage in circulation was fake. Yes, counterfeiting in America was off to a good start. Thank you.